Welcome everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming by. It's a Saturday here in Malaysia. It's also a Saturday there in New Zealand. It is. <laughs> and what time is it over there? We are on six o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. And what's the okay. time with you, Krista? Is it 2 p.m.? 2, 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Okay, let's just a little bit more and then I will get started. Okay, let me just put myself there. Okay, I'll just remove this. Then we'll put both of us here together. No. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm sorry you had to eavesdrop and hear our little conversation. We were thinking that when Mala said audio is clear, so we thought, okay, maybe they heard the music that both of us were hearing, right? I just wish we were talking about something more interesting to eavesdrop on, Krista, because <laughs> that, that, that was pretty ho-hum. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they, they got to uh, eavesdrop on something rather than uh, nothing. So for those of you who have just joined us, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I'm glad we uh, are among friends. So like I said, you know, they're, they're pretty forgiving. Okay, so let us get started. Uh, okay, let me just, this. Okay, so today we're going to do this. Okay, so welcome everyone. Welcome to the Reboss Studio Facebook Live series. I see a lot of our friends here. We have Eileen, we have Jerusa, all the way from Sri Lanka. We have Mala. The first one, I think Mala was the first one who came in and said hello. She's very punctual. Uh, then who else do we have? We also have, wow, there's a lot of, uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, things here. Oh, Mala says Kia Ora Oli. She knows oh, Mala is on to it. Kia Ora Mala. <laughs> Okay, so let me get started with the introduction so we can get right into it because I think a lot of people are interested in this topic for various reasons, right? Uh, and uh, this is interesting enough. And I hope that instead of just the women joining us, I hope men will also come on board because I think it's a very important conversation that we should be having. Okay, so okay, let me just introduce Ollie. Okay, so Ollie is a passionate person she's bubbly she's passionate and she's passionate most of all about ending period poverty period waste and changing the way we talk and act about menstruation as a society we struggle to talk about menstruation which restricts us from solving some of these issues and i think it's not just over in new zealand but also in malaysia itself so as a result ollie founded the social enterprise wa collective to connect people back to their own bodies and to the earth using humor, heart, and inclusivity. Every menstrual cup sold subsidizes one for someone in need. Each cup lasts 10 years, saving around 2,500 disposables from reaching the landfill. So uh, Oli calls herself the executive menstruator and founder. And so she's using menstrual cups as a conduit for social change. She's also very accomplished. She's an Edmund Hillary Fellow, Obama Foundation leader, TEDx speaker, award-winning storyteller, and social entrepreneur. She's also a dear, dear friend that I met last year in Hawaii when we were both selected to represent our respective countries for a women's leadership program. She's at the forefront of a paradigm shift shaping what it means to inhabit this earth consciously and with a pair of ovaries. I like that, Ollie. It's good. <laughs> yes. Ollie is passionate about systems change and believes that it is through redrawing the processes and ideologies that shape business that we can fast track having a net positive impact for the people and planet. Okay, welcome to our Facebook Live series, Ollie. Oh, Krista, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Um, <laughs> amazing, amazing to be here and so nice to speak with you, Krista. I miss you so much. I know. The last we spoke was, I think, last year. Yeah, it was. Okay. It was. So now I'm going to ask you something that let's start with the very basic, right? What's the menstrual cup? That's a great question. Well, yeah. Krista, I've prepared a little something for us. It's a menstrual cup. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> the easiest way to describe. 
Absolutely. Um, so a menstrual cup is a reusable alternative to a tampon or pad. Um, they are made, these ones here, um, our wire cups, are made out of medical grade silicone. Um, and they fold out really small because like this, wait, where's the camera? There we go. They look a bit terrifying. You're like, how does that go where? Um, which is understandable because, you know, we're we get a period and then most of us, you know, it's like, hey, welcome to having a period. Most of the time it sucks a lot. Here's a pad or here's a tampon and don't talk about it to anyone. Um, and so with a cup, it is something that's quite new to the conversation. Um, so they get they get folded up um, and they go, they go to about the size of a tampon. Um, it's then, oh, I'm really struggling with this camera, sorry, it's backwards. Um, it's then inserted into the vagina um, where it unfurls and collects period. Um, stays there for up to 12 hours before it's uh, removed, emptied, and then reinserted. Um, so yeah, it's ridiculously easy once you get the hang of it, but it's really, really a new conversation. And of course, it's a conversation that with periods we're really taught not to have. Okay, that is the menstrual cup that you are uh, selling, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we manufacture our own cups. Um, they have full material traceability right back to the quartz silica that they're made from. Um, each cup is zero waste produced um, and it's also ethically made um, because we know exactly who made them um, and that they got paid a decent living wage as well, um, which is really, really important to us. Um, yeah, because I think looking more broadly at issues, um, if we're looking, you know, we're based in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and if we're helping people in planet here, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be actually damaging people and planet through a production line because are you really helping? Yeah. I see some friends joining us. Hi, Gina. Hi, Noor. Noor's all the way. Oh, Noor. 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 <laughs> we're, we're having a lot of uh, familiar faces on this uh, Facebook Live. So let's get to the very beginning, right? You didn't wake up one day and decide that you wanted to start a social enterprise what was the spark or where did that inspiration come from cool question krista um honestly well i can tell you right now that 13 year old ollie she would be so embarrassed by me right now she'd be going what are you doing you're talking about periods you're talking about them with other people um so there's certainly been been a journey um involved in getting to the space um, I grew up on our family farm in the middle of the South Island of New Zealand. And it was there that I think that's where my entrepreneurial journey actually started because there was always something that needed fixing or always something that needed doing. And there was always a limited amount of time um, because either the weather was about to change and it was about to be a massive storm um, or, you know, the cows were coming in. And so that needed to happen by then. Um, and there was also a limited amount of resources. And so I think that that was a really, really beautiful chamber um, to host my creativity. Um, and yeah, so that was sort of where things started. Um, at 19 years old, I then moved to India after starting to study chemistry and religion and realizing that that wasn't the path that I needed to go on right then. Um, I have a problem, Krista, where I'm just interested in way too many things. Okay. Um, and so that was, <laughs> that was my start. <laughs> but, but, that um, is your, but that is your personality. I think you're interested in so many things, right? It is. And I just, I can't help it. It's brilliant. Um, and so, so off I went to India. And before I left Krista, um, I heard a talk from two fantastic women from an organization called Days for Girls. And Days for Girls, they sew reusable cloth pads with the premise that if a girl gets her period and she doesn't have access to any resources that she can even use to manage her period, she then drops out of school. And then of course the cycle of poverty continues. And growing up on the family farm in a place of privilege where we'd always had food on the table, so therefore we'd always had access to menstrual products as well, um, I simply hadn't thought of that. And honestly, it blew my socks off. And I said, right, 
there's something that I can do here to help. And so off I went to India um, with a massive bunch of cloth pads, my toothbrush and myself, um, and ended up working with a beautiful local nurse up in the foothills of the Himalayas um, where we distributed these together um, because it wouldn't be right going, me rocking up from Aotearoa, New Zealand, going, hey, hey, I'm Ollie, this is how you should manage your body. That's just, that's not on. Um, and so we worked in together um, so that it was culturally appropriate and um, we could deliver these. And that's where the journey started, Krista. And then when you got back from India, was that the time they decided, okay, I need to do something too back in New Zealand? Yeah, so um, I'd been tossing and turning while I was away whether to study or not, and I decided to um, because that that privilege was open to me, um, despite having a huge um, student debt coming out of it. Um, but so I, I carried on that path, um, studying linguistics and marketing. Um, and I really love how we're going to be talking about marketing here because I have a very turbulent relationship with it, um, okay. which is almost That's ironic. Good. Because That's good. Both, of, both of us have some these two things in common, right? I, oh, yeah. I, did my, I did my master's in linguistics. <laughs> Terri oh, terrible no. things. I know, but I chose to do it. I chose to do it just for the Beautiful. fun of it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love it. And people and people think I'm crazy for doing things like that because I mean, linguistics, right? Oh, but there's there's so much depth of knowledge within that space, Krista. Hey, and it really just taught me to to unpeel the ideologies um, that I'd picked up through through growing up. Okay. Um, and was able to see the world a bit more clear, um, clearly. And so, so it was while I was there that I started to question the period conversation in New Zealand. And I realized that we don't really talk about periods here either. This was late 2016. Uh, and then I put out a survey um, because I was curious. We got 1,000 responses back, and that blew my mind um, because, quite frankly, <laughs> oh, questions, um, because, quite frankly, um, I didn't think anyone would want to be talking about periods. But it was from that that we found out that um, of 1,000 students, one out of every three had skipped class at some point because they didn't have access to menstrual products. Um, and so our collectors started off very humbly as a shoebox on the wall um, at my university where people could put tampons and pads in and other people could take them out. Um, and it was upon questioning that of if that was actually helping or not and where the what was actually happening to the environment and the process um, that that led to doing something much more sustainable that was actually helping both people and planet together. Yeah, so that, that's where I pulled up Mala's uh, comment. She said she heard about this, but had huge concerns about its safety features, example, uh, ru rubber, plastic allergy. So good to hear that you're producing this sustainably and with medical grade quality material. Yeah. Mm, thank you, Mila. It, it's so important what we put inside our bodies um, and especially um, inside our bodies where periods come out um, because it is a hugely sensitive and important environment. Um, I don't know what um, the policy is like uh, in Malaysia, but I can speak to the context of New Zealand um, and that a menstrual cup is not classed as a medical device. So that means that any Joe blogs can import any type of floor scraping that they find that's made out of absolutely anything, mark it up by 300% and sell it on a shelf. And that's really, really worrying um, because often they're filled with things like fillers. Um, and we don't even know what fillers are, but um, to give you an example of that, um, this is one of these really dodgy little cups. And the way that they're, they're really squishy, um, so they'll actually get squished by the pelvic floor muscles and often not open properly um, and put people off a cup, which is really detrimental to everybody working in this space. Um, but I don't know if the camera will be able to show it, but if you really, oh, where oh, is it? See, it oh. white. Yeah. yeah, so it's a really good test on any silicone product. If it's proper medical grade silicone and it's pure silicone, if you stretch it, it won't change. It will just it will just be clear. Um, but these one, that one goes white. Um, this one, this is a wire cup. If you you can whoop, you can stretch it absolutely anywhere, and it just it still stays the same. Um, and so it's really really important that we're making the right choices for our bodies. But it's really difficult, right? Because um, yeah, as you know, Marla, you've heard about these and you've heard about the issue, which is awesome. Um, but it's just such a new conversation that we don't realize um, that it's yeah that they can be made out of dodgy things. 
that's a that's a good one because I I never knew that they were made out of dodgy things. I know there are some like very, very very cheap uh, mm-hmm. menstrual cups, and then there were the premium ones. But I didn't know that there, there was a big big difference in terms of the yeah. material, the grade of material. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, and it's not just silicone that they can get made out of. Um, there's also TPE plastic, um, which is proven to be safe. Um, and then there's also um, rubber as well, which one of the first commercial menstrual cups in the 80s um, was made from. And yeah, as long as you don't um, have any allergies to rubber, they're totally fine as well. Um, so it's just about finding a brand that actually has that material traceability, um, which I think should be the case of, of any type of product that we're putting inside of our bodies. Okay, so any if you have any comments, those of you who are watching, feel free to put it in the comment section and we will get Ollie to answer all your fears, all your doubts, all your questions about silicon menstrual cups, right? And then we will clear the air. Because I think that's why I said when I wanted to talk about this uh, very important topic, I wanted it to be framed not just about menstruation, even though it is pretty taboo, I mean, I'm sure you know it too, pretty taboo to talk about it. It's something that you don't talk about it, uh, no one talks about it, even though it's a very natural biological thing that we have uh, that is beyond menstruation, right? And we mm. all must be on menstruation. Like you were talking about the girls who had to miss school because yeah, you didn't have any access to all these uh, important things that they should have had. Absolutely, and that, that, that happens the world over. Um, it's definitely not an issue that was confined to the space where I was living in India and definitely not an issue that is confined um, to areas of New Zealand where we're working as well. Um, it's it's a real, real global issue. Um, and, you know, we didn't choose to have a period um, as people who have ovaries either. Um, and um, I, in, my, in my TED talk that I did, I very much spoke to this and that it's the subscription model that we never chose to subscribe to. Um, And in a very westernized context, having a period has quite become a pharmaceutical process um, rather than actually a natural biological function that's actually sacred um, because because through having a period, that's that's part of life giving. Um, And we've just come so far from that conversation. And that's one thing, um, one thing that I do believe is really, really special about any type of reusable menstrual product, be it a menstrual cup, um, be it a reusable cloth pad, um, or be it period proof underwear, which are coming up now as well. You're actually, you're confronted with your own body, um, often in a society that teaches us to hide from our bodies and to be really ashamed of our bodies. Um, and that is so disempowering. Um, but to actually be confronted and go, whoa, this is my period and this is the color of it and this is how much there actually is, that's really powerful because it's with that information that we can actually start to understand our bodies, right? Um, yeah. And I recall you having this conversation with me, Krista, as well. When you started using a cup, you're going, whoa, yeah. I yes. had no idea yeah. that all of this was But this is TMI, right? TMI. <laughs> TMI, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm using it, yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't yeah, sorry be, to drag you I mean, would be such a, would be such a, a hypocrite, on, uh, to be a hypocrite on my part, to talk about it and yet, you know, to promote it and to talk about it without even trying it out. So, yes. Mm. Yeah, kudos to you, Krista, um, because it's something that is really bold and and I so respect. And um, it's also something that's just getting more and more normalized the more that we talk about it. Um, And especially if it's talked about positively, because we're just not we're not taught to talk about periods positively. Yeah, we're kind of like shying away from the discussion, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that really doesn't, it doesn't help on many levels. Um, It doesn't help with the, um, you know, it doesn't, uh, sorry, cat scratching up the couch behind me. Stop it, Ian. Um, so, <laughs> Do you want to show us the cat? <laughs> um, but, you know, not talking about periods, it's, it's detrimental on so many levels. It's detrimental because then we can't, can't have the conversation of what it means to actually not have any resources to be able to manage periods. So then um, women are missing out on, on participating in life fully. Um, and then it's also completely negating the conversation as well um, around environmental damage of what disposable menstrual product, products are actually doing because they stick around for a long time in our environment. I think I saw somewhere on your website that you said uh, how many 
thousands of disposables or, or millions were going to the landfill and they could basically wrap the earth yeah, go around so the earth, right? I, I'm yet to do a global statistic, um, but in little old New Zealand with a population of 5 million, um, yeah. we use enough disposable menstrual products each year to wrap the entire circumference of the globe. And these products, they can take up to 500 years to decompose if they're not made of organic um, organic ingredients. Um, and man, it's, it's bonkers um, because it's a single use item and we're just, you know, chucking our periods away without, without second thought. Um, and yeah, it's, <laughs> it's pretty batty. And it's not the period that it's the issue, it's how we're managing them. Okay, I think I saw, I, I pulled up the stat, 357 million disposable menstrual products. Uh, so that's New Zealand, right? New Zealand sends 357 million disposable menstrual products to the landfill each year. To put it in context, this is enough rubbish to wrap the circumference of the earth. Yes, I thought that was something interesting that I should have pulled, I should put up and remember about uh, this. Absolutely. Okay, so let's let's talk about your favorite topic, marketing. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> okay, so how has it been for you? marketing when you yeah, first started well, social enterprise and until now sure um well it's really interesting studying something as opposed to actually working in the field and realizing that you can study something until the cows come home um and it's not the same as actually just doing it um so i and i very much have a love hate relationship with marketing um because um, I find that most of the marketing that we're exposed to, um, or at least that I've been exposed to in my lifetime, has been a push for material-driven consumerism, which, frankly, I've had enough with um, and is not serving us, it's not serving our deepest needs, um, and it's not serving the environment either. Um, and so I came into it with that lens of just really not wanting to push a product onto anybody um, that they don't need it. Um, but then I realized that marketing can actually be a force for good, um, much like business can also be a force for good. And if you're running a business, people need to know about it. Um, and so so we very much, when we first started out, um, we hired a PR agency um, to help us out. And this was 2017. And the period conversation in New Zealand was starting to have some ripples in it. It was starting to flow. Um, but it certainly it certainly wasn't a full flowing conversation. Um, and so I'm we intended. just got, <laughs> intended. <laughs> and so we we got rejected from absolutely everywhere. We got rejected from mainstream breakfast shows, um, for instance, and they came back to us saying that no, they don't want to start birds and bees conversations with their listeners, despite them running some very very concerning stories about war, about sexual assault, etc. Um, and they're not willing to have a conversation about a period. And so they're like, right, this is going to be a bit more difficult than we first thought. Um, but the cool thing about a menstrual cup is there are so there are so many benefits to them. Um, there is the money saving aspect um, because you know you have one cup and it does you for um, depending on the brand anywhere between two and up to ten years. Um, so you're literally saving thousands of dollars. Um, you have the environmental saving as well. Um, if a cup um, like a wa cup lasts up to the ten years, you'll be diverting around two thousand five hundred disposable menstrual products from going to landfill um, so you've got the environmental angle um, you've got the health angle as well because you're not putting any chemicals um, in and around your body um, and then you have the connection angle as well um, which for many people entering the period conversation for the first time is a lot it was a lot for me when I first started um, but coming full cycle around pun intended again <laughs> um, it's, it's, that's a definite draw card of just being able to get to know your own body um, and work through that taboo yourself and find the empowerment there um, and so that was sort of the marketing sort of mix that we had from the start um, and then our early adopters were very much people who are on um, the sustainability bandwagon and for the environment um, and so wanting to do something for the greater benefit um, of not only the people around them but also the planet and so that's where we started Krista. Okay, so there is a comment from Malar, so I want to read it out. She says, 
This is like vaping, not regulated. So no idea what's in the filler juice sold in shops and online. Thanks mm. loads for showing the difference in quality with those items. Medical quality, good grade material stretch. Uh, equals no change to material color. Oh, yeah, that, that is a good one. And then, okay, that's one from Jerusa. So I'm going to put up Jerusa's one. She says, uh, in Sri Lanka, not only Sri Lanka, India too, most of the girls facing problems, they can't spend money to buy a pet. So how can you solve the problem too here? <laughs> Just asking you. <laughs> Jerusa, we're coming, and so are many other beautiful organisations working in this space. Um, but absolutely, this is very much a global issue um, that anyone with a pair of ovaries can either relate to um, or have experienced. Um, so, yeah, we're coming. <laughs> we're coming. <laughs> Um, and, you know, it, it's not just about menstrual cups either because a menstrual cup isn't going to be right for everybody. Um, and so it's very much about choice. Um, and um, my personal opinion on that is that the centre of choice um, should be reusable options. Um, so we're talking menstrual cups, reusable pads, period-proof underwear, because then it's actually giving us the tools to be able to have autonomy over our own bodies rather than having to be reliant on a handout from an external source. You know, you've got something, it's your yours um, and that's you off you go um, and there's something really really powerful in that um, so thank you thank you for your comment Teresa. so let's get back to the conversation on marketing so has marketing become easier now now that you have realized that there's a category of women who are more into the uh, sustainability who talk about eco-friendly options mm. for themselves yeah, nice, Krista. It's definitely become a lot easier. Um, and a mark of that as well, actually, is um, I, I can't I can only speak to um, the the space within New Zealand, um, but there's been a whole lot of other grassroots organisations popping up doing things about periods as well. And that is such a win. Um, because it means that we've got community groups working with communities um, and that's a real sign that people are really starting to be way more willing to talk about this um, and so from our point of um, so from our angle with marketing um, it's been very much sort of us catalyzing some things some other people catalyzing some things um, and then that just breaking down the taboo around the conversation um, and then um, yeah with that um, getting a whole lot easier because now we know what we're doing a bit more as well um, and so you know we, we know that we have our audience who um, really comes with this because um, comes into this because they like the sustainability aspect we have our audience that really just wants to save some money um, but the cool thing is that no matter why someone purchases a menstrual cup or no matter why um, someone needs one um, the benefits are going to be the same it's going to be saving money it's going to be helping the environment as well and it's going to be way less impact on one's body so that's pretty cool okay so i'm going to ask you a pretty controversial question <laughs> go for it okay because um or in asia possibly even malaysia there's this concern that if you insert a menstrual cup in you uh will you break your hymen mm. and that is a very valid concern because there are still people who believe that that is the most uh important part for for a, mm. for a woman or a girl basically so what do you have to say to that like would it be dangerous would it be you know something not suitable for girls it's down to personal choice krista um, and that looks different for absolutely everybody. But what I can say um, is that there has been a lot of myth around the hymen. Um, and a hymen can break or stretch just from doing normal life activities. Um, that can be from <laughs> running, that can be from riding a bike, that can be from going for a jog. Um, it's not necessarily correlated with actually inserting anything internally into the vagina. Um, and as well as that, of course, like having one's hymen partially intact or intact isn't correlated with virginity either um, but you know it's it's also not my place to speak for your culture either um, and I respect that um, and so it's very much down to personal opinion um, and what someone is comfortable with um, but from a health perspective totally fine to be using a menstrual cup and um, from a young age and we have heaps and heaps of people um, who who've got their first period their mums bought them a cup and they use the cup straight away and 
and it's incredible. And that is so cool because it means that actually um, that person is being able to have the tools to understand their own bodies um, rather than actually that coming from a man potentially later down the track and that's how your understanding comes in. So it's pretty powerful, um, but it's definitely, yeah, it, it's a really, really tricky subject um, and it's down to personal preference, but I think there also needs to be a lot more awareness um, yeah. in this space and breaking down the taboos around it because long story story short um if you're comfortable with using a cup um at any age it's totally fine yeah because i had to ask that question that's like the elephant yeah. in the room kind of question right <laughs> if i didn't get that if i didn't get it out of the way people say like, well, you're not asking the question that everyone wants to ask <laughs> it's so hard to ask that question so we have yeah. a malaria question to ollie where can get this item online link <laughs> <laughs> we'll post up the online link, link to our website, Mala, and we ship worldwide. Um, so I'd be very happy to send you a cup. Um, and we also have some based um, in Penang as well um, with Krista, yeah. which we need to get happening at some point. So so yeah. watch the space. Um, and there's possibly as well some local organisations that you could support to, um, depending on what way you're wanting to go with that. Um, but yeah, to look back on that last conversation as well, Krista, um, yeah. another, like, another sort of unspoken fear that people have is, oh like will this cup stretch me um because it looks it looks really broad um wait a minute right let's let's show them the diameter of the cup <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean it's, it's small it's small but the reality is um that that um that the muscles of the, the vagina are ridiculously robust um and so no a cup will not stretch and that actually does the opposite um and it's the equivalent of doing kegel exercises so strengthening your pelvic floor um while you're using the cup um and you don't even realize it um and so yeah that's another question that we often get but it's not asked but you can tell that people are wanting to ask it <laughs> yeah, okay so so you're you're the you're the queen of uh, questions and answers for this cup i'm sure you get asked all kinds of questions right we've okay, got so now, everything asked to us honestly and it's it's really cool um because first of all actually it takes a lot of courage to ask a question around a taboo um so i respect any question that we get given Okay, we have a question number two from Mahler. Does it come in different sizes or colors? Yes, Great question, Mahler. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have three different sizes. And so that means we can cater from a really, really light flow all the way to a really, really heavy flow, um, including somebody who has heavy flow um, because of, say, the likes of endometriosis. Um, a cup can be really, really fantastic um, because with the... Sorry, I'll go here. With the... Um, this is the slightly bigger one here as opposed to our smallest one. Um, and this one, um, they have measuring mills in them as well. So if somebody um, suspects that they have endometriosis or some type of other complication going on um, with the uterine area, um, you can actually tell how much you're bleeding and you can take that to your doctor and you can go, hey, I'm losing 100 mils every couple of days please take me seriously. And so it's an utterly fantastic tool for that. Um, and so, yeah, we can cater from light flow to heavy throw flow between our three sizes and also from first period, manaki, all the way through to menopause um, because the muscles do shift and change a bit throughout age, which doesn't matter because all vaginas are great. I love that last comment. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> In terms of colours, um, in terms of colours, we just have the clear colour um, because we believe that that's the least impact on the body and also the least impacts on the planet um, because we're not having to add anything else other than the silicon in there. Um, but we do realise that there is a demand sometimes for colour. Um, so we're working in this space and seeing what we can come up with um, for something that's super safe um, and also has a um, positive impact on the environment as well, or at least neutral. So, okay. yeah, thank you. Great questions. Ma Mala is great. Mala, Mala has question number three. <laughs> love, I love Mala. Okay, if someone is going through perimenopause or start of menopause, use this. Would this be? Would there be a need for a lubricant? I think yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, you can use a lubricant with a menstrual cup, um, with a wire cup in order to get it in a little bit easier. Um, but actually, all that's needed is you can um, you can get the cup 
and um, run it under some water um, and that just makes it slippery um, and then it glides in. And what users find as well that actually um, at using a tampon is very different to using a menstrual cup because a tampon, it's rigid, it's hard, it's dry, it's especially unfun when you're on the last few days of your period where it's not as slippery. Um, but a menstrual cup, it doesn't absorb, it just collects your fluid. Um, so that means that no matter when you use the cup, it's just going to be able to slide in and slide out, and it's not going to be an issue. And speaking of that as well, I forgot to mention right at the start, um, the menstrual cup, it stays in place by the muscles holding it, um, but at the top, it also forms a seal, and the seal means that it stays in place and that it also doesn't leak. And so that means that you can go running, you can go swimming, or you can just lie on the couch and eat some chocolate. Whatever gets you through your period, it's going to look after you. Um, so yeah, long story short, you can um, just wet the cuff if you need it to be a bit more slippery, um, but most of the time it's totally fine. And if you wanted to, you can use some water-based lubricant as well. Okay, wonderful. Great questions. Keep the questions coming. Uh, this is a session where we get to answer everything, right? All your doubts and all that. So, okay, let me get back to the question I wanted to ask you. Yes. 20, 2019 was definitely your year, right? You gave a TEDx talk. Honestly. <laughs> you gave a TEDx talk, right? You represented New Zealand at a women's leadership event in Hawaii. That's where we both met. And then you helped prevent 2.2 million tampons and pads from reaching the landfill in Aotearoa. Did I pronounce it correctly? <laughs> Aotearoa, yeah, you're on it. Yeah. And you became an Edmund Hillary Fellow. And this is the part which I want to ask. You also met Michelle Obama at last year's Obama Foundation event, which was in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Now, I want you to tell that story. Because <laughs> that, is, that is the best story ever. It's an amazing story and I'd happily share it, Krista. Um, so uh, myself, along with two other incredible leaders from the Asia Pacific, were invited um, to Kuala Lumpur um, for a five-day convening um, with the Obama Foundation. Uh, it was a five-day values-based leadership course, um, which was truly, truly fantastic. Um, it really, really invited a space of vulnerability um, and openness, which I didn't expect to find there necessarily. Um, it was about day three and it got announced um, that I was invited to personally meet Michelle along with um, 11 other entrepreneurs um, working um, in the women's rights, women's empowerment um, and sort of access to education space. Uh, and so I said, oh my God, great. <laughs> um, and so we were, we were shuffled into this wee room. Um, there were 11 of us there. Michelle was there. Um, uh, Barack Obama's sister Maya was sitting beside me um, and Lana Condor, an actress, she was in there as well um, opposite us and there was this wall of paparazzi, some bodyguards. It was quite an intimidating environment, Krista. Um, and I said, oh God. <laughs> and sort of instead of the butter being butterflies sort of in my stomach, it was more like cows gallivant gallivanting around. Um, and so we had each had two minutes to to share to share our story and the space that we were working in. So I sat down, did a big deep breath, and when it came to my space to speak, my turn to speak, I was just Ollie. Um, because actually, in linking back to the marketing conversation, Krista, there's a real, real power in being one's authentic self, um, no matter how goofy it is, because uh, I can be quite goofy. Uh, and so I sat on my chair, um, I kicked off my shoes, sat cross-legged, um, and just spoke of the importance of um, of the space that we're working in and the intersectionality between women's rights issues, women's empowerment, climate change and sustainability and how we can't be tackling one without tackling the other because the entire thing is interrelated. Um, chucked a, th a few bloody good puns in there as well um, and finished off by saying, and we do this work because no girl should miss out because she's born with a mighty pair of ovaries. And at this point, Michelle Obama, she cracks up laughing and goes, yes, Ollie, that needs to be on a T-shirt. So I said, yes, Michelle, you watch this space. Um, and then I said, by the way, and that's where, why I'm wearing these earrings. Um, they're cherries and um, that fruit are ovaries. And so this is like wearing one's ovaries on the outside with pride. 
And at that point, the room just lost it. All tension was released. There was a mighty big laugh. Um, and then afterwards, Michelle, um, Michelle came up to me and she said, Ollie, can I touch your ovaries? <laughs> and I was like, Michelle Obama, please touch my ovaries. And so she leans into the, these very pair of earrings and just cradles them. Ah. Uh, it was a moment, Krista. Um, incredible. And she gives really good hugs as well. Um, someone who gives a good hug, they've definitely got a good tick from me. Um, so it was incredible to meet her um, and <laughs> um, come out with such a wonderfully bizarre story as well. So these these earrings are basically sacred now, um, is what I have to say. <laughs> that To me, that was uh, something that only you can tell the story. Be because... I, I read it, I read it on your blog, and I thought mm. that would be such a, a good story to tell. And that's oh. that's why that's why people need to know the relationship between your earrings and Michelle Obama and your work. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, just, I love anyone who interacts with these, you know, they get a piece of Michelle's energy as well, um, which is beautiful. Better than having oh. them framed <laughs> on a wall. <laughs> <It's ridiculous. Okay. laughs> so so the, the, the golden question is, are these earrings for sale? I mean, do you have... <laughs> <laughs> Right, I know. I, I was, I that that did run through my head, but no, yeah. um, they're, they're much more precious than that, and it's beautiful to be able to have them and tell the story. Um, and then, you know, if I am invited to share the story, someone to touch them and go, oh, oh my gosh. Um, but you know, Michelle's a human too. We're all just humans doing our bit. Um, but I mean, she's done some extraordinary bits. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. Okay, so I would want to ask you this: What do you know now that you didn't know when you first started your business? Wow, Krista, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> I know, right? I'm this asking tough questions. I'm asking all the, all the tough questions, yeah. Oh, it's good. It's good, Krista. Um, the one thing that mainly springs to my mind when you say that um, yeah. is it's linking back to the authenticity um, and it's linking back to a values conversation. Um, when I first started, I was like a sponge um, and I didn't, it was my first time stepping into a space of business. This is still really my first job. Um, I've had a couple of others, but as far as a full-time job goes, this has been it. And so I've done a lot of learning. And at the start, I was a sponge and I was soaking up anyone's advice and finding out everything that I could and taking it all on board. And eventually, actually, my own thoughts and my own values and my own beliefs started to get quite diluted um, because I just sort of became this really broad picture of trying to do it right. And there was a moment of realization that actually I'd started this whole thing on my intuition with obviously having my eyes wide as open as possible and taking on as much information. But there must be a point where you lean into your own discernment and trust yourself. Um, and so one thing that I've very much learned in this space um, is to trust yourself um, and, and really stick to my values. Um, they've definitely been challenged at some times um, and it's actually been through sticking with my values and going no actually we started this for this reason we started this to end period poverty sustainably we started this um, to make a positive impact for both people and planet so by doing this even though maybe we might earn some more money from it um, it's actually not going to be happening and I think that's been challenged so many times that if we, if I'd sort of veered off into that space, I don't think we'd actually have a business now. And so it's, yeah, one thing I've learned is very much the ability to stick to my values and the importance of it. Hmm. I, I, I hope I hope that was an interesting question for you because I was thinking, what kind of hard questions would I ask Ollie? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to bring up this. Uh, comment from a friend, Alexandra Wong. She said, I was wondering if there was a backstory to the earrings, very meaningful. Yes, Alexandra, her earrings are like <laughs> fantastic. There's a story oh, to are. her earrings. Yeah, and there's a bit more to them as well. Um, I I really love public speaking, um, it's, and I'm so grateful that I do. Um, it's definitely been a massive tool, I suppose, in the marketing space. Going back to that as well, to actually, you know, be able to voice um, what one's doing um, pretty well to a crowd. Um, but I still get really nervous. And so when I first started out, when we were pitching our business to people, um, when we were trying to get some crowdfunding happening and getting our voice out there. Um, 
I started wearing these. Um, a friend of mine um, had made them for me and they were so bold that I hadn't actually worn them up until that point. And one day I put them in my ears um, and I got on the stage and I just felt so powerful because I was wearing these really batty, bold earrings. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, they're so big and they're so bold and they're so bright um, that a lot of people can't help but comment on them. And so they're the most beautiful way um, to start conversations. Um, and especially because fruit are ovaries, um, which, you know, you often don't realise, <laughs> but it's definitely a fact. Um, and so, yeah, they're an incredible conversation starter and confidence boost um, because, yeah, you you go into the world with purpose um, when, you, when you wear a pair of bold earrings but i think the earrings are so you and i think your friend did, did you a great favor by giving you this earring so that it represents you on your ears um, we yeah. among all among all the women that we have leaving comments we have a guy <laughs> we have <laughs> we have daniel because i was i was actually telling daniel i'm sure he's one of those bold and enlightened men who will come and listen to the conversation because it's so interesting right i mean where do you get conversations like that especially with someone like ollie <laughs> so, also, hi daniel yeah hi daniel and i mean you know men we're, i think women and people who have periods really have a role to play in actually inviting men to the conversation um because often it's just assumed that it's a woman's conversation and i think that's when it's actually really damaging um because one thing i've also learned along this path um if we're pushing for any type of behavior change or social change we need to be bringing everyone along with us um and so within the period conversation that includes the blokes too um and I have a little anecdote to add to that if we've got time, Krista. Okay. Um, yeah, um, we were um, pitching for a little grant um, from the Rotary Club in Wellington, um, where I'm based in New Zealand. And um, it was a room predominantly full of men. And I went into that space um, and went, oh, God, what am I going to do? This is, how do I do this? And I went in with humour, with puns being myself um, and we won that um, and it was incredible but the most incredible thing was that a man came up to me afterwards on a Zimmer frame reasonably elderly um, and and really from his heart and with tears in his eyes said thank you thank you for giving me permission to speak about periods I've gone my entire life and always wondered and always had questions about um, my wife's cycle um, and and just haven't been able to ask. And you've given me permission through this conversation. So thank you. And wow. to me, that was so much more powerful than getting any grant, um, was having that type of impact for one person um, and just being able to give permission. And so it's very much, yeah, about permission, I think, is a massive, massive word in the space. Yeah. I like that. I like. I thought that that is actually very interesting. We we didn't talk about that, did we? We never. You've never mentioned that in any of our conversations. And I yeah, thought oh, that this is so much, Krista. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> but but, yeah. but I but I think that sometimes you need to be a bit bold. You need to give uh, mm. yourself and other people that um, space to talk about it. Absolutely. And going back to the marketing um, part of this um, corridor or conversation as well, um, as we've found it, it's with boldness, um, it's with honesty, it's with humility, it's with humour. That's how we bring people on board to this conversation um, because humour can just whack down a wall of awkwardness. You meet via a, a shared laugh um, and it opens up a space for discourse. Um, and so that's really powerful. And it's being sitting in this conversation comfortably and boldly as well, as you say, um, that's that's what really changes the narrative around this um, and gives people permission. And, you know, it's not about making people feel uncomfortable either. I think there's a really, really delicate balance of meeting people where they're at in this conversation um, or lack of conversation often. Um, and then coupling that with the boldness, the tenacity um, and the courage to speak like periods are normal. Because when we speak like something's normal, it becomes normal. True. And Daniel says he loves your earrings. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. 
<laughs> and actually, on that note, we're about to um, relaunch them onto our website as well um, as a wee fundraiser um, for what we're doing. Um, and so they'll have global shipping um, so anyone can share the cherry goodness. Um, and so watch out for those next month if you're keen. Okay. What's in the future for WA Collective? Cool question. Um, so um, we believe that, I mean, New Zealand is a small country. We can really solve period poverty and we can do it right. Um, so at the moment, um, we are, uh, we've been involved with talks with the local government, um, with Jacinda Ardern um, and with the Ministry for Women as well. And we've managed to get a uh, $2.6 million budget allocated um, to get um, to get across the board funding into schools to get um, menstrual products to students, um, which is so fantastic. Um, and so because, you know, it, to solve period poverty, poverty properly, um, it's going to take both grassroots community initiatives, industry and government all working together, and then we can do it. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, the conversation at the government level, though, is very much at the disposable um, level with products of tampons and pads. Um, so we've got a while to get there um, before I think we can build something that's um, really core and transformative and actually looking at this through a systems lens. Um, so we're really excited to further that um, and then keep on supporting our community here and possibly look at what we can do with some global partnerships as well. But, you know, there might be people better placed in their own communities to be doing that work. Um, and so, yeah, it's just looking at how else we can support. Um, and, yeah, there's heaps and heaps of avenues that we can go down, Krista. Um, and so it's yeah. pretty exciting. And, and right now we're really in a process of coming back to our why um, and I think it's really important that we do that every so often. Um, one really challenging thing about our business model um, is that it's inherently anti-capitalist um, which sucks for making any money um, and that's because <laughs> our cups last so long because they're such good quality that um, we don't have any repeat customers. Um, and so as far as our values go um, and our mission goes, that's fantastic. We're not changing it. But as far as actually getting a reliable revenue stream goes, it's really challenging. And so we're needing to grow through constant access to new markets um, and also um, with rolling out other products that are actually needed um, that can support people too. And so it's very much about finding that balance. Um, and it is really, really challenging, um, but it's a hearty challenge. And it's one that um, as 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 climate change issues um, and um, biodiversity collapse issues come more and more into the forefront um, and then th that clash with economy um, that we're going to really have to be facing these issues more as a global community as well. Um, and so pretty exciting to be working in this space already and seeing what we can do um, to actually be having a positive impact on the environment and for people through Are business. You are you thinking of other products, other solutions in your mix of menstrual products? Yeah, we've got some things up our sleeve, Krista. Um, and okay. yeah, we can't air them out to the public yet. Yeah. Um, but there's some pretty exciting avenues that we can go down, um, especially within the route of inviting people to connect more in with their bodies. Um, because I'm really, really passionate about that because I strongly feel um, and have noticed that with our audience, when someone starts to use a menstrual cup, you start to understand more with your body. And when you start to understand your body more, you start to nourish your body more. And when we nourish our bodies more, that means um, the things that we're putting in and on our bodies are coming from a better place in the environment um, and respecting the environment more. Um, and so the body can very much be a channel um, for, yeah, for for positive impact on the planet as well. So yeah, I'm pretty excited about that space. Okay, final question before we wrap up. Uh, what's that one key takeaway that you want people who are watching this or listening to this remember from our conversation? We, we, did, we, we went through a number of things. We talked about the cup, we talked about marketing, we talked about uh, people and the planet and period poverty. So what's that one yeah. thing that you want them to remember? Oh, thank you. That's a beautiful wrap up. Um, we have traversed um, a lot of terrain. <laughs> um, and 
The takeaway um, that I'd really love us to sit with um, is the invitation to have courageous conversations um, and be having conversations with ourselves, um, with others, with friends, with family um, that we're not taught to have and that we're not actually invited to have um, because there's some real, real power in that. And so whether it's having a conversation about periods um, with your best friend um, or having a conversation about something else that's been on your mind for ages that you haven't found felt um, the courage to be able to speak to, um, just lean in and and have that courage to speak. Um, I think that's what I'd really like to leave, leave with, Krista. Okay, thank you so much. So I've put up this uh, to find uh, what you offer on Facebook or Instagram or even visit your website. Are there any other places that you want them to go to? Um, no, that's us. You've surmised it well. Thank you so much. And apologies for the background noise. The family's just come back and the dog's doing all sorts of things. Um, <laughs> but no, you've got it well. And um, thank you, Krista, so much for holding space for this important conversation. Um, it's been fantastic. Um, and thank you so much for everyone's questions that have joined us. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, so uh, let's have one of this. She says, Malar, I think she's becoming your fan. <laughs> Thanks, Ollie, yeah. for being so oh, real and funny. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that's, that's what I wanted to do with this space, is also to have conversations. Sometimes the conversations may not be easy, and it may mm -hmm. not be pl so pleasant. We may not be talking about uh, those nice and sweet and, you know, pretty things. There could be some not so pretty things in the picture, but I wanted to bring that uh, conversation in so that we can have more of such spaces for, for women to talk mm. about things that really matter. And that's that's my purpose of bringing Ollie. And of course, you know, Ollie is such a bubbly personality. Uh, she's such a great person to interview. That's why I thought, let me, let me just start with her. I've got a <laughs> bunch of all my other friends from the Hawaii program that I really want to bring on. Uh, oh, yeah. Friends from They're all over Asia. Nice. All over Asia Pacific, uh, from India to Sri Lanka, Jerusa was from Sri, uh, Sri Lanka, and of course from even Fiji, Samoa, and all the other islands down south, right? So once more, thank you for an amazing, amazing interview. I'm so glad we had this conversation. Just to let all of you who are watching know, she is so busy, I had to really literally pin her down, pin Ollie down and say, hey, Ollie, let's do this. But we just have to work around our schedules because right now it's about uh, it's 3 3 p.m here and over there it's around 7 7 p.m yeah. it is it is and yeah. krista thank you for pinning me down um i'm really grateful um for you tracking me down and getting this happening um it's been fantastic <laughs> well thank you so much uh, ladies and gentlemen i must say ladies and gentlemen because we do have the gentlemen in our space maybe the, there are gentlemen in our space but they didn't leave a comment so yeah, so thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this session with Ollie. If you have anything you wanted to ask her further, you find her on her website, drop her an email, and she'll be happy to tell you more about the menstrual cup or anything else you want to know about period poverty. So thank you once more, and we will see you again because this is actually a series that I started during uh, the COVID pandemic lockdown that we had in Malaysia, but I took a break. And now I'm back again. So I hope to have this uh, first Facebook Live series every two weeks. So for those of you who are watching, please uh, follow our page so that you'll be updated on the next one that's coming up. And as I was telling some people, I say, I have very, very interesting friends. Then, yeah, so we're going to have more conversations like this. So thank you. Usha, okay, let me just put up. Usha says, thanks for sharing, Oli. It was a good session. Thank you, oh, Usha. Thank you so much for joining us and for your comment, Usha. Yeah. And also there's Eileen. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen, for watching all the way through. You were there from the very beginning. So thank you once more, ladies and gentlemen. We will see you again uh, in two weeks' time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.